Good evening, everyone. You're very, very welcome to our service this evening. Um, I hope that you were able to hear the bells being rung just a few moments ago. Um, and today is Ascension Day, and so for that reason, we're uh, continuing uh, in worship this evening. Uh, we have a special service of the Word for Ascension Day. Um, and I trust you've had an opportunity to see that on our Facebook page and perhaps to download it and print it off so that you can follow along. If you haven't, don't panic. Um, it won't prevent you or preclude you um, from joining in our worship this evening. And we trust that um, we'll come bringing ourselves to the Lord, the risen and ascended Lord Jesus, um, who reigns in glory and who is in heaven at the right hand of his Father at this very moment where he intercedes, where he prays on our behalf. The Lord is for us and he is with us now. And we want to pray that we'll know his blessing as well as his presence in our worship together this evening. Today also marks the beginning of a 10-day wave of prayer, which our bishop, Bishop David, has called us to right across the Diocese of Down and Dromore. And we're being encouraged to pray in different ways and for different groups of people and in different groups over the course of these next 10 days. If you keep an eye on our Facebook page and on the diocesan website, uh, you should find different prayers for each day. And we're also having a couple of special events um, over these next couple of days. So tomorrow evening at 8 o'clock, we're hosting a meeting on Zoom for any young adults within our parishes. Now we're saying roughly between the ages of 18 and 30, but there is a bit of stretch and give in that. Um, so even if you're a few years older, don't panic. We'd love you to join us, at, to join us as well. And uh, we're meeting on Zoom, as I say. The codes for that have been sent out um, via uh, post. But if you haven't got them, then please just get in touch with me and I'll gladly provide, that, provide you with them so that you can join in. And then, so that's tomorrow evening at 8 for our young adults. And then on Saturday morning at 11 a.m., uh, we're doing something similar for the women of our parish. And my wife Amanda and Shirley Bennett are going to host that. And again, ladies, they'd love you to join them. Why not get yourself a nice cup of tea or coffee, uh, maybe a nice piece of cake or a biscuit, and uh, gather up around Zoom at 11 a.m. on Saturday morning. The same access codes apply. Uh, and again, if you need those, please get in touch with me, and I'll gladly provide them for you. Our services are on as usual this Sunday, God willing. And then next Wednesday evening, as part of this Focus on Prayer, uh, we're planning to hold a, a prayer, a healing prayer service next Wednesday evening at eight o'clock. Um, a few folks have already been in touch with me and asked if, if uh, some names could be included for prayer um, at that service. And please do, if there are others whom you'd like us to pray for, simply by mentioning their first name or even just their initial, uh, then get in touch with me um, either over Facebook uh, through calling to the rectory, drop me a note, whichever way works best for you, um, and we'll gladly include those names. And there'll be a chance to pray um, for healing for ourselves in the course of that service next Wednesday evening also. So look forward to your company then at 8 o'clock next Wednesday. Lots going on. May the Lord bless us in and through it all. Let's turn to our service sheets as we come to the Lord to worship, there are some words of greeting which take a responsive form. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. The Bible says, Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to the faith we profess. We're going to sing together a wonderful Ascension Tide hymn. In our hymn books, it's number 285. The head that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now. Let us worship together. That's what 
once was crowned with thorns, is crowned with glory now. A royal diadem adorns the mighty victor's brow. The highest place that heaven affords is his, is his by right. The King of kings and Lord of lords and hands eternal light. The joy of all who dwell above, the joy of all below, to whom he manifests his love and grants his name to brothers and sisters in Christ, for 40 days we have been celebrating with joyful hearts the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, his bursting from the tomb and his defeat of the power of sin and death. He appeared to his disciples many times and told them about the kingdom of God. Today we recall how he left this earth and returned to his father ascending into heaven to take his throne over all dominions and powers. Trusting in his reign over all creation and submitting to his kingly yet loving rule, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith and make our confession to our heavenly Father. We pause silently in the presence of the living, loving God. God, our Father, you exalted your Son to sit at your right hand. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you are the way, the truth and the life. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Holy Spirit, Counselor, you are sent to be with us forever. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May the Lord forgive what we have been, help us to amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen and the collect, or the special prayer of the Ascension Day. Let us pray. Grant, we pray, Almighty God, that as we believe your only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to have ascended into the heavens, so we, in heart and mind, may also ascend, and with him continually dwell, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Bible reading this evening is from the book of Acts, chapter 1, beginning at the first verse. Acts chapter 1. And the author is Luke. Um, he is following on in Acts from his first work, which of course is the Gospel of Luke, and in both cases, as we see from the opening of Acts, he is writing to a man called Theophilus. 
In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over the course of 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up towards heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them, they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up towards heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And Father, we pray that as we bow in your presence, that your word may be our rule that your spirit may be our teacher and our guide, and that your glory might be our chief concern for the sake of Jesus Christ, our risen and ascended King. Amen. Well, life has changed substantially in the last couple of months for us, hasn't it? All sorts of ways that we couldn't have imagined doing life have suddenly become the normal. And one of the effects that lockdown has had on quite a number of people is that they're now being asked to work from home rather than going to their regular place of work, the office or the school or wherever it happens to be. Of course, it doesn't work for everyone, but maybe for some of you watching this evening, you've had to adapt to that, to the new norm. And of course, it brings with it both a variety of pleasures and a number of pitfalls. The pleasures, well, they might be things like not having to face the daily commute each morning or maybe being able to work while you're still in your dressing gown. But there are pitfalls too. Um, who of us could forget that wonderful, now infamous moment on BBC News? Do you remember when the, I think it was a scientist or a, a political commentator was being interviewed? He was in his home study and suddenly the door swung open behind him and in toddled his, his little tiny uh, baby or toddler. Um, she was in her walker, I think, and she proceeded to steal the show from everyone. Her dad just haplessly had to battle on with the interview until mum came frantically running in and grabbed the child out. So there are pleasures, but there are also pitfalls in working from home. Today, as we've already said, is the Ascension Day. And some clever person has observed that the Ascension is a bit like the day when Jesus once again began to work from home. Jesus' work on earth, at least the work in his physical body, had come to a conclusion. And so, as we read in Acts chapter 1, Jesus and his disciples are brought to the moment of farewell as Jesus prepares to physically leave them and return home, to return to his seat of glory in heaven. And the disciples are left in this moment with no doubt that this is it. This is the moment when, when Jesus is leaving them. 
Verse 9 says that he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid them, hid him from their sight. My gut feeling is that the disciples knew all too well that this was the last moment when they would see Jesus on earth. And in that sense, it was the end of an era. It, it, it marked a, a closing, a goodbye for them in their lives. And it's interesting to note how the disciples react immediately in the aftermath of Jesus' ascension. We're told in verse 10 that they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going. We can almost picture them there, can't we? They're gazing upwards, beholding this incredible sight. They're amazed, but they're also perhaps feeling a little bereft. Maybe even something of a sense of bereavement comes over them as they find themselves left alone and Jesus taken, at least from their physical sight. It's not unusual, is it, whenever a particular season of our lives comes to an end, that, that we can find ourselves puzzled, confused, not really knowing which way to turn. In a sense, we can be a bit like those disciples. We can be left staring, staring into the past, focused on what has been, but not really too sure what to do next. That can be as true in the life of the church as in any other part of life. In the West, in Western culture, with a few notable exceptions, we would have to acknowledge that the church has largely been in decline, at least in the visible sense of that word, over the last number of decades. Numbers attending services have been going down on a general trend. And perhaps for, for those of us who have lived through that, through those decades, it can be so easy to become nostalgic about the past, about the better days of yesteryear when those pews were all filled. And we might even be tempted so far as to think that the church's best days are behind us. We can fall into that way of thinking, can't we? Focused entirely on the past, on what has been, and wondering where we go from here. But let's look back at our passage for some help. Because look what happens to these disciples in verses 10 and 11 of Acts chapter 1. We're told that as they gaze at the sky, two men dressed in white, they are clearly angels. They come alongside them and tell them, stop looking to the sky. And then these angels reassure the disciples that the same Jesus who had just been gloriously taken from them into heaven, that he will one day return again in all his glory. And something shifts in the disciples with those words of the angels. Suddenly, the disciples find their attention transitioning from what has been to what is yet to come. The angels encourage them to think ahead, to think ahead to the time when Jesus will come again. And the implication then is that the disciples are to start from that moment on getting ready, preparing themselves for Jesus' second coming. Now, although we live 2,000 years later, 2,000 years down the line from those disciples, in one sense, nothing much has changed. Today's disciples, you and I, are still part of that same era in history. Because to date, Jesus remains ascended in glory, but he has not yet returned. He hasn't come again to display his glory to the whole world. And so it stands to reason that in many ways, we are in the same boat as those early disciples, that we too are to be focused and ready for that time when Jesus will come back, when he will return and every eye will see and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Do you see then that as Christians, both the past and the future matter to us? As Christians, we're to be people who 
Keep one eye on what has been. We're not to lose sight of Jesus, all that he has done for us through dying and rising again. But we're also to be forward-looking people. We're to keep our eyes firmly focused on the time when God's kingdom will be there for all to see in glory. And so our job as the church is to prepare ourselves and to encourage others to prepare themselves for that time when Jesus comes again. Now, how do we do that? Well, in many ways, some of the answers are plain and clear. We prepare ourselves in part by by giving God glory when we meet in Jesus' name to worship, because we know that when Jesus comes again, all the glory will belong to him. We prepare ourselves by leading lives day by day that honour and please the Lord Jesus because when he returns, we know that he will put a final and decisive end to all sin and all injustice. And we encourage others to be prepared by sharing the good news so that God's kingdom might grow on earth as others find the love of Jesus find and discover his grace, find him to be their all in all. I believe that in these days, these very days through which we're living, that there's a growing sense of anticipation amongst churches right across denominations that God is doing something in our day, that God is on the move. Some of you might be familiar with the name Pete Gregg, He's quite a prominent uh, Christian in the UK and indeed around the world. He's the founder of 24-7 Prayer. Pete Gregg, along with many others, has been praying for revival in our land for many, many years now. And I want to quote to you this evening just a short excerpt from something that he wrote on his Facebook page only about 10 or 11 days ago. Listen to his assessment of this situation. He's only human. Um, he is, doesn't have a, a special insight, um, but nonetheless, there does seem to be something worth hearing in what he writes. He says this, something is stirring in the UK. There, I've said it. I've hesitated to write this post. It's probably premature. We're still bang slap in the middle of a vast crisis and no one really knows how it's all going to end. But here's the thing. Over recent weeks, and particularly over this last week, prayers that some of us have been praying for decades suddenly seem to be finding answers in the most unexpected ways. And then he goes on to note some of those unexpected ways, some some things that have been happening during this crisis. Things like the the two million plus people who have viewed the UK Blessing Song online. Uh, Things like the survey reporting that three million new people have turned to prayer in the UK since lockdown began. Uh, Things like the, the, the the statistic that a quarter of the UK population are now attending at least one online church service in any month. And then I go back to quote again from what Pete Gregg says. He says this, Advances come a step at a time. It is by celebrating the small things God is doing right now that we find faith for the bigger things that he's not done yet. If a shivering man spots sparks in the hearth on a cold, dark night, he's unlikely to walk away. He's a fool if he says, oh, those embers are nothing, too tiny to warm me, too fleeting to fight the cold of such a dark night. Neither will he pour cold water on them. Instead, he will draw close and kneel, reverently blowing on the embers, carefully adding fuel to build a fire. And so we see these signs and pray, more, Lord. We sigh deeply and say wistfully, well, if you can do this, maybe you can do that. Does tragedy inevitably precede resurrection? 
could this be the beginning of the spiritual awakening in our nation for which so many have been praying so faithfully and for so long? And he concludes, my friends, this is a time to pray with greater faith, preach with greater confidence, and plan with greater ambition. You know, it is no coincidence that prayer is the exact response of the disciples to Jesus' ascension. Verses 12 and following of Acts chapter 1 tell us that the disciples returned from having witnessed the ascension and they went to an upper room. And then in verse 14, look what it says. They all joined together constantly in prayer. Remember, the disciples didn't know exactly how things were going to pan out in those days. They knew that Jesus had promised them the Holy Spirit, but they didn't know when that would be or how he would come or where they would go. But they prayed. They put their trust in God. They showed their dependence on him by coming together in prayer. You and I don't know what God has planned for the years ahead. We hope that he will use us for good, no doubt. But only he knows what doors will open, what opportunities will arise, how his kingdom will grow. But in the meantime, let us, like the first disciples, be faithful in prayer. I want to commend to you this diocesan initiative that we embark upon today, our 10 days of prayer that will run us through until Pentecost. Use them profitably. Use them to deepen your dependence and your sense of expectation on what the Lord will do in our day, in our generation. Jesus may now be working from home, but he is working as hard as ever. He has not stopped loving or caring for any part of his creation, including you. He loves you. He cares for you. He died, he rose, and he ascended for you. And even now, tonight, he is at God's right hand, interceding for us. May we know the power of prayer in our day. May God re-energize us to focus on prayer. And may wonderful things happen for his kingdom and for his glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. We affirm our faith using this question and answer form. Do you believe in God the Father who made the world? I believe and trust in him. Do you believe in God the Saviour who redeemed humanity? I believe and trust in him. Do you believe in God the Holy Spirit? who gives life to God's people. I believe and trust in him. Let us pray. Let us join our prayers with those of our Saviour Christ, seeking the Father's blessing and the gifts of the Spirit. Jesus Christ, great High Priest, living forever to intercede for us, pray for the Church your broken body in the world. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Jesus Christ, King of righteousness, enthroned at the right hand of the majesty on high, pray for the world and make it subject to your just and gentle rule. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Jesus Christ, Son of Man, drawing humanity into the life of God, pray for your brothers and sisters in need, distress, or sorrow. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Jesus Christ, pioneer of our salvation, bringing us to glory through your death and resurrection, Surround with your saints and angels, those who have died trusting your promises. Lord, hear us. 
Lord, graciously hear us. Jesus Christ, Lord over all things, ascended far above the heavens and filling the universe, pray for us who bear witness to your glory and power. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Entering into these ten days of prayer across our diocese, we pray that the Holy Spirit would come to inspire and equip us to share the good news of Jesus Christ with our friends, families and local communities. And so together we pray, Almighty God, you as your ascended Son has sent us into the world to preach the good news of your kingdom. Inspire us with your Spirit and fill our hearts with the fire of your love that all who hear your word may be drawn to you and that your kingdom may come on earth as in heaven through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for the coming of God's kingdom in the words our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Well, as our time together draws towards a close, we're going to sing another powerful hymn appropriate for this Ascension Day from our hymn books number 267, Hail the Risen Lord Ascending. be with you and also with you. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Set your heart on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you always. Amen.